of everything. So, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat to all out there who listen to content of everything. Actually, as with most of my videos, they are unscripted, they are ad hoc, and as yet untitled. So, meeting Brother Tariq as I was coming through the park on this lovely summer uh, afternoon evening, the first sunny evening for a week, after a week of rain, constant rain, so much rain in fact, I thought I should have to go and buy bits of wood to build an ark, just like Nabi Nuh, like Noah, to go out there. So now the weather has changed. Brother Tariq is here, and I want to ask him a couple questions about Khartoum, because Brother Tariq, although he prefers not to appear on camera, so although it, see, and although it seems that I'm speaking to myself, he is standing not very far from me. So Brother Tariq, let me greet you personally. Assalamu alaikum. Marhaba ya akhi. Uh, I want to ask you a couple things as a person from Sudan, from Khartoum. Um, what can you tell us? Starting, I think, from the latest events, it's best. Let's, be, let's begin with the latest events, the most recent things, and we work backward. Yeah. So tell us what has happened recently in Khartoum with the city. Explain the city and what has happened recently to it. That's what they say. Now, give us now a context. Let's widen the lens a bit and go back further into the past and tell us a little bit about what actually caused this sit in in Khartoum. Yes. We're discussing Khartoum. They wanted, uh, they wanted to have an interim time of two years yep. to get the elections going to elect a president of Sudan. But in the meantime, between the two years, who's going to control what's going to be the country? So there was debate between the military and the civil, the civil party, the civil, um, the civil group, and they're going to get coming together and form the ruling until that happens. So for some reason, the military decided to do what they did. Signed the 3rd of June, you're an aid. That's when they started killing people, destroying them. Killing people, throwing their bodies around, them, invading homes, and doing all kinds of I am told, and I would like perhaps if you can corroborate what I've read, that now they are discovering bodies of women, over a hundred so far, and they have discovered, the doctors who have looked at some of the, the cadavers have discovered evidence of sexual violation. Not only that, there are people alive, and you know in the Muslim tradition, there's a certain amount of reticence regarding sexual violation. But many of the women who have been beaten up and attacked by the police, still alive, not now the dead bodies, have also been raped. Is the, what can you say about this? I haven't heard about the women that are still alive. It's, a, it's, not a, guardi it's a Guardian article. Yeah, mm. yeah so mm. I haven't read about the Guardian article, mm. but I, I've heard about the soldiers going in the houses, raping women, and killing them, and tying their bodies to the streets, and throwing them in the line of river, so it sinks down the wall yes. and back up. Yeah. And, but now, Hundreds of bodies are coming up, and a thousand more people are just missing. Yeah, but the last time I discussed this was last week, and what I was saying is, what I was witnessing is 21st century methods of resistance being pitted against 19th century methods of warfare. And the reason I said this is I believe that the people who have now changed their name. They used to want to be called a Janjaweed. Now they have a name, a rapid, uh, they have a new name. And they are in fact, under Hemeti, their leader Hemeti, they are in fact more powerful than the, um, the Sudanese army. 
So this actually part, this paramilitary force, which was once the Janjaweed, is now actually more powerful than the army with whom they are aligned. Because um, I think the same army was the same one that was used to go to South Sudan a few years back. Mm -hmm. So once they went to South Sudan, our machine was given a mind here and given a ride in bringing over soldiers from other countries as well to get into that army at the time. That's why when they come into the country, this is not their people. Yeah, so they didn't really care what happens to them because it's not into their country. Speaking to Professor Bona Malwa last week, he said pretty much, he basically you're reiterating a lot of what he himself told me. And the people who were gathered with him said that what you find is the people, that, that, that particular branch of the military, I call them a paramilitary, but now they are military. Now they are part of the actual military. They were, they were actually beating up a man who began to speak to them in the Bagara Arabic dialect, whereupon it was revealed. In fact, he said to them, I am from, um, and I, uh, I am Rizagat Bagara. And that one day disclosed this, when he said this, they released him. They had begun to beat him up, but then they released him. Which leads a lot of people to the conclusion that this must be the new, the, the Janjaweed under the new name. They are Western Sudanese from mostly this Bagara group of people, Bagara Khumra, Bagara Hodro groups of people, some of the Rizegat and all those subgroups, and they are the ones actually perpetrating a lot of the atrocities in Khartoum, rather than the proper, proper Sudanese army. I don't think proper Sudanese people that grow up there, people from there, yep. they actually go there and see their family members getting killed and stuff like that and be okay with it and go and do the same kind of family. It just doesn't, just doesn't make any sense, especially if you know you are Sudanese people, they're not, they're not that violent when it comes to certain things. You don't pursue them. They're doing just attack you. Well, I want to support what you're saying to the extent that in 1984-85, when Nimieri was forced from power, and Nimieri was a military man, and he had the full backing of the government. But a similar street, series of street demonstrations occurred at that time. I, looking at your face, I can tell you may not even have been born then. And they forced a military government to stand down. And then there was an interim for about a year, after which they called elections, and Sadiq Al Mahdi became the president at that time. Now, I suppose they felt that those tactics back then ought to, especially since we've moved into a world where those tactics were used in Seattle, they were used in London, and several big cities in the world to, to bring to the world's attention the power of corporate capitalism and why it should be controlled. And because places like Washington and, so, well, Seattle and London deployed these forms of popular protest, maybe they thought it would be successful. What do you think? So, the way they see around the world happening, they expected the same thing would be for themselves. But anything you see from the point that when the, when the president from the last 30 years been doing, should indicate to you that the way you're going to be going about this is not really going to be the same way. It's not going to be the same way. They're good hearted people. They thought they're going to get the same thing as everybody else in the world. That's what was happening right now. Could you tell us what happened during the so called Arab Spring when certain countries did, like Tunisia and Egypt, but significantly not the Sudan? And tell me why. 
the outcome was different in the Sudan. There was not the same level of popular coverage around the world. I don't see it as big as is was when like with Egypt. When it happened in Egypt and Syria, I see it all the time on the news. But Sudan, I'm not seeing much about it. No, unless I go to Al Jazeera or one of the Arabic channels, I'm not gonna see no, no coverage about what happens. So that's that's one of the main things as well. And then you had all these kind of different independent groups around the world that were helping the Egyptians when they cut off the internet in Egypt, they will find that different ways to get into the into find a way to find the internet service in Egypt to get all this information out. But when it comes to that, I don't see the same thing. People talk a lot in the Sudan about the deep state. The extent to which Jabhat Islamiya and Bashir's cronies have infiltrated every part, every sector of the state, the deep state. And that is why it's taken that much longer to, to prize Bashir from his position. Some say that what the army has cleverly done is moved him to the back burner and that has placated, hoping to placate the people demonstrating thinking that that would be enough for them to get up, take down their tents, strike the camp, and go home. Recognizing that that hasn't worked, I think it, they have unleashed the Janjaweed upon these people with the new name, the so that if it ever comes to a reckoning, they can say it is not Sudan's forces. These are these murahibun from from the Min al Harb. Al-Bashir apparently has been taken, been taken to prison, but nobody has seen. Muharibun, sorry, yes. Nobody has seen in prison. Nobody claims that he's in prison, so nobody knows where he is right. at the moment. At the time when he was there, in each department of the government, the person that was most qualified for the job did not get the job. He made sure his own people was putting that position of power to make sure they're loyal. So now, I guess, what's the point of going with the power? Nobody knows where he is. Yes, the story. There are some people who are using Malcolm X's famous turn of phrase with regard to Hartum. The chickens have come home to roost. Meaning, of course, that previous Sudanese governments, not just Bashirs, have used people like like Janjaweed like forces to quell dissent in outlying areas of Sudan which were too far to immediately access and the Janjaweed developed a life of its own it didn't start with Bashir my own personal experience of being in Sudan in 1988 was of people from the four ethnic group telling me that the Bagara have been unleashed against them by Sadiq, Sadiq al-Mahdi. Uh, so what Bashir was doing, I have no way of saying whether this is true or not, but the guy I was speaking to, or the people, the four that I spoke to in Abdurman, were people of integrity. So it's the history of the Janjaweed being unleashed on others in the Western Sudan has a history that goes beyond Bashir, but does not exonerate Omar Bashir. Far from, in fact, he used them even further, as you said, against the South. So now, when I speak to politicians from the South, they say things like, yeah, now the people of Khartoum, the center where the power was held, Jazeera Medini, Khartoum, that area, where, no, power of Sudan was concentrated, now they have begun to feel the effects of what they had permitted or encouraged in Western Sudan and in the South. How do you respond to that, Yatare? What do you say, Brother Dao?
Well, this is what I wanted to raise with Brother Farrakh. And this is Brother Farrakh is saying, when you compare the uh, disproportionate coverage of the Arab Spring in Tunis and in Misr, in Egypt and in Tunisia, to what little coverage in relative terms it is getting in Khartoum, one can also extend that argument to saying, now the people of Khartoum may understand what has been happening in their name in the south and in the west. I don't like that line of reasoning myself personally because yes, I understand the pain of somebody from Western Sudan or from South Sudan saying this has been happening just for a long time. I personally know a friend of mine whose mother I'm talking about in the 70s was kidnapped, the Nuba woman from Kordofan. And he's a Muslim from South Abbasia in, in, in Durban, South Abbasia. His mother was captured in that time and so his mother. All right. So a lot of these things were happening and our people were just not taking it seriously because perhaps as Muslims, we are chosen aside. I'm positing that. As Muslims, and as a Muslim, I cannot dissociate myself and pretend all of a sudden now I'm not a Muslim. So I have to say we. I can't say those Muslims. No. We Muslims may inadvertently have chosen a side. And we have decided that because we are Muslims, whatever is happening in the South, the people of the South are non-Muslim and therefore they are wrong. So we must choose the side of Omar Bashir and whether whatever happens, we have to believe that his position is the right one. And that had happened in a lot of the wider Muslim world for a very long time. They had been going on. There were people who were saying, this is Tariq, the situation in Darfur. Uh, there were people who were saying, this is because it was first highlighted, I believe, by Colin Powell. And he is the first person, Colin Powell, to call it a genocide. He called what has happened in Darfur. And to which the non-Western media replied by saying, this is America's attempt watching the influence of China in Africa. This is America's attempt to regain lost ground on the continent of Africa. And that became a problem. It became a problem for me because it's similar to when I listen to people like Sir David Attenborough making a case for climate change and global warming. And if I bring that to my people in the so-called developing South, the first thing they say is, do not listen to the West. It is an attempt to stymie the rising power of China, which is the world's second largest economy. So, uh, so to which I have to reply, well, my only problem with that is, <laughs> I'm not going to say we don't, I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm going to say there are two dogs fighting and I'm the bone. Africa is the bone. It's now no more a fight between America and the Soviet Union. It's between America and China and we Africans are the bone. We are the ones, in the, no, we are the victim. No, we are not stuck in the middle. We are the victims of it. Because when you, an African dictator cannot pay the Chinese for some infrastructural development, he actually takes the infrastructure. So the, that bridge is now mine. Can you imagine they own a bridge in your country? And so forth. So it's another kind of colonization. But I'm digressing from my main point, which is about Khartoum. A lot of people who listen may have never heard of Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. And when formerly the Sudan was the Sudan and the Republic of South Sudan, it was Africa's largest country. And in this country, you have the ethnic groups and physical types of it. The Sudan will represent a microcosm of the entire continent of Africa. So what I'm saying about this brother Tariq is already South Sudan has gone its way. The rest of the country, if this, this business in Khartoum, this demonstration is not brought to a reasonable solution, that what is called Sudan today, the rest of it will disintegrate right. in, a, in the worst possible way. What do you say to that? 
I agree with that because South Sudan, we didn't really see the images of what happened there. To see the image of what's going on, that really affects people. So we saw what happened in media, we saw images. So that had got people to react. But in Sudan, you just hear, you just hear in news, you just hear in news. So in South Sudan, for instance, we heard about it, but you just hearing about it doesn't really affect you as much. Yeah, you're not reacting. You're not, you're not reacting as much. I just want to ask your opinion on that as well. Oh, yes. Sorry. Just, you know how, like, for example, Farad mentioned that early on with the Arab Spring, Tunisia. No, 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 no. No, no discipline, discipline. I'm doing this. Yeah. I, I direct this. Yeah. Tunisia, Syria, Egypt, there was mass, uh, I mean, whatever the protests and stuff, but there was mass coverage. Now, in your opinion, why is there not <coughs> that same level, or at least <coughs> proportional level, of, of, that, of, that reason, of that coverage in Sudan. Again, Sudan be a, yeah. has been in bad order with the West ever since they believed Bin Laden, uh, sorry, uh, Omar Bashir, was, no, Hassan Turabi was complicit in bringing in, giving Osama Bin Laden refuge in the Sudan. From that time, of course, you know, the Sudan was declared a terrorist state, yeah. and Bashir was asked to go before yeah. the Hague, yeah. which I, in, I, I, one thing I agree with him, he refused. Yeah. To the, it seems as if the ICC is a criminal court for Africans only. They asked for Mugabe. They asked, for, <laughs> you know. Anyway, sidebar. The yeah. point, the point the brother made is interesting. So you had a question because I want to talk about the possible fallout from the disintegration of the Sudan. But go ahead with your question. answered your question as we say in my country you beat your drum and you dance to your own music you actually answered your question I do believe as brother Tariq said this is a grass root it's a genuine it's it's over 30 years of resentment building up like a pressure cooker I don't believe America has any uh, there were no is there's no interference yet from any other power my greatest fear is if this country begins to disintegrate, you look, I'll come to the West last. Take Kassala. Perhaps we know how mischievous Afarwariki is in Eritrea, right? Because of the, the court, the, what's the, the nice manner of, I forget the word in English, the pleasant demeanor of Abi Ahmed, they signed the border treaty between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But Afar Werki does not like to lose a fight. And he may believe he needs more land. And if Kassala, eastern part of Sudan, secedes, I predict some interference. Okay, but that is small. I want to build up to bigger. That is small potatoes. <coughs> yeah, well, that's, I'm building from small. I'm going from small to big. Let's take it now. If, again, it secedes, you have the Gambela province part of Ethiopia. They have always felt where the Anwak and in Nuer, which is now in South Sudan, uh, on both sides of the border, they believe there is land in not only South Sudan, but in that North Sudan part that is theirs, in that area, from south of Gedarif, but in that area. The, the Ethiopia does believe that some of that land, and it will be a problem there. That is also still small. What Egypt might attempt to do from Lake Nasser to Wadi Halva, again, is small, but it's a possibility. Because remember, like you said, if it's an internal problem, historically, you've had the two horse fight between the Mahdi uh, and uh, the Mahdiya and the Khatmiya, the Mirghani people, who have always supported a union with Egypt. 
the Mirghani people and the have always supported that union. And you, although it may come from within, it could easily become connected to external forces. That is still small. To me, the worst of the theatre, the worst theatre to focus is West, Western Sudan, Darfur. Brother Tariq, you mentioned mercenaries coming in speaking French. That means Chad. That means Republic du Niger. That means Mali. We know, yeah, we know what is happening in Mali. We know what is happening in uh, Niger. Well, Niger is very, very poor. But we know what is happening in Chad. For a long time, the Zahawa have wanted a greater Zahawa land, which would include bits of Western Sudan and bits of Chad. So, what would you, how would you, looking into a crystal ball if you had one, looking at the future and looking at a possible disintegration of Sudan if this thing doesn't go right and I'm fearing it won't go right because with Sudanese people as you know when you start raping women you've gone a step too far and I'm worrying if you can put this ever back together again so tell me just just expand on everything I've just asked mm. the way you're saying well if it keeps going the same way they don't find a solution to what's going on it's gonna get worse and worse because the military are trying to set up people as well. I've heard in front of one of the mosques, they put, a, put some guns out there and they start antagonizing the people so they can actually pick up the guns and start attacking the military so they can have an excuse to actually go on and do what they want to do. Yes, but if they, if they don't find a solution, like you said, all these vultures from all the other sides is gonna break down so the country slowly and slowly can be fading from every part. So I put it to you, I am the ginger weed. You are the peaceful demonstration. I am the devil's advocate now. I have put these weapons near your mosque. I put them, right? And I start goading you now. As we do in my country when we want to fight. I start goading you, right? You're gonna get a couple hot heads who will say we can't take it any longer. That's from one side. From the other side, you will plant your own mercenaries of ginger weed. I forget the new name of this paramilitary force that's part of the government army. Yeah, rapid, that's it, rapid, uh, yes. Ra rapid something forces, that's the name of the, yes. Now it's Jinjaweed. Yeah, they are originally Jinjaweed. They are Jinjaweed. But what I'm saying about them is, they could plant somebody in this. So the problem I see is, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But okay, I am the Jinjaweed and I start doing things around to force you to pick up those weapons. What do you think is going to happen? Well, if I'm saying, I'm, I'm giving you the weapons to do that, I'm already set up. Oh. I'm already set up for when you pick up the gun, I'm already gonna have my guns ready to do that yeah. now. And then whatever excuse I'm gonna use, so you guys pick up the guns first and it's done. So we have to defend ourselves. That's, that's what they're going to do. So can you describe the nature of this resolution? Because in Syria, Libya, and all these other places, the Arabs were very quick to pick up the guns and yeah. back at the Arabs. Uh, yes. And that's not happening in Sudan. So in Sudan, Sudan, is that there in what? No, but what, 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 brother, what, 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 Number one. Now, secondly, you put guns near them. You put yeah, guns yeah. so that they can easily get, get them. You are creating a situation, you're saying, where they have no choice to react, except that their reaction will earn them bad press. You see, they were, they were going to do this. This is who they, this is their, these are their true colors. And to me, my main worry here, on, that's why I'm thinking ahead, as to what will happen regarding a possible disintegration of the country into its constituent parts. North, north, uh, west, uh, east, Kassada, west, Darfur, Kordofan center, Kordofan, Nuba mountains. This one, I suspect, may go with South Sudan. I suspect if a big, if it comes to it, Kordofan, or they become themselves only. But what I am looking at is since the Sudan has so many borders with so many other African countries, given its size, the fallout on these neighboring countries. For example, we have recent evidence, well, it's confirmed, but it's been going on, of Russian 
in China, in Central African Republic, taking the minerals the way the Chinese do everywhere else. Because the Central African, if you think of Central African Republic, located where it is, it is almost like, remember when the Russians invaded Afghanistan? As well in Sudan. Yeah, Russia's if you look, exactly, if you look at, if you look at Afghanistan, it's almost a no man's land between the Central Asian Republics belonging to Russia at the time, there were Soviet Republics, and India, Pakistan. Afghanistan is like nobody owns it. It's like, like everybody, nobody, it's like everybody else's backyard. Nobody kind of owned it, like. And so somebody had to push in there and make it a sphere of influence. But because of that sort of backdoor quality to it, the Russians thought they could get away with it. Central African Republic is the same. It is a kind of, it's like you said, landlocked. Who said landlocked? It's landlocked. But on top of that, Central African Republic is almost the, the, the inside, inside where you don't go. It's the dead center. Of, a, of the continent, of a, what people just don't go. In that sense, it's like the eastern part of your country, the Congo, the DRC. That, and similar because it's not very far. Now, imagine, if you will, that country reverberating on the back of Sudan, in, uh, disintegr the disintegration of the Sudan. We have a lot of terrible things to look forward to if the Sudan as I say, if the Sudan fractures in the... Guns everywhere, proliferation of weapons from the Sudan. If you take Brother Tariq, the Nile River, we know that since Ethiopia has started its industrial leap forward, Egypt has been very worried about the quantity of water from the Blue Nile coming down. Now we have, if the Sudan disintegrates, the other source, the White Nile coming through Uganda from Rwanda, will be the other problem. I, when I was in Kampala, I saw the Egyptian hydrologists, the people who work, who study the rise and fall of the waters of the Nile. I saw them there very concerned about the stability of Uganda and the, pros the, the continued stability since the genocide of Rwanda because they know that, that these countries are the headwaters of the White Nile like Ethiopia, Lake Tana I think it is the headquarters of the Blue Nile which both for people who don't know on this listening to this join it on the Roman, the White and the Blue Nile rivers. One, the Blue Nile coming from Ethiopia, highlands. The White Nile coming through from Uganda and the Republic of South Sudan. The two Niles meet. The confluence of which is Omdurman in Sudan, which is the sister capital to Khartoum. And these, as these rivers meet, they flow northwards towards Egypt. They are joined by the Atbara, but it is said of the White and Blue Nile joining together in Arabic, they are the, it's the longest kiss in geological history. These rivers meeting together like a kiss and flowing towards the Mediterranean. Now, Egypt will quite rightly and reasonably be concerned about the disintegration of the Sudan with regard to their water. Why? Even with the Nasser the Ali, the, the Nasser Dam, the agricultural level of Egypt has fallen because what is that when you build a dam when you build a dam you slow the flow of the water so the water is pressing forward but now there's a massive depression into which the water flows the lake it deposits yes yeah. the revolution don't want to take this land back because the army was helping hold stick a pin in that I want to come back to that I want you to talk about that but what has happened is because I'm speaking about this as in terms of the agriculture because at bottom all of what we're discussing here is ecology environment and agriculture the problem of the ginger weed and the fall is a problem of desertification those bagara the word bakara as for those who don't know bakar kau the bakara are the arabs who had moved into pasture lands that were not as 
good for camels as for cows. So they switched to cattle husbandry and you call them the Bagara. However, that land that used to support cattle, um, cattle herding has now become dry through desertification. And they, the Bagara, are now pushing onto the lands of the Four, the Kresh, the Tunjur, the Dinka in Bahr al Ghazar area, the Miseria, um, Bagara, and so forth. So, what you have, so what I'm discussing actually here, the base of all of this is a problem in Africa throughout that area, the, the Sahel Sahara area getting drier. The problem in Mali with the Dogon and the Fulani, or with the Songhai and the Tuareg, it's the same, or Amazigh if you prefer, it's a similar problem. But what I'm saying, coming back to the Nile and getting back to the point, when you have that Nile River problem, once you have that problem of everybody has a dog in the fight of the Sudan, which they should, right? Brother Tariq, I want you to look down the road into the future. Looking at, okay, the point I didn't make is this. Sid al Ali, the, the um, not Lake Nasser, the dam, when a river slows, the Nile River is flowing through the Mediterranean. When a river slows because of the depth of a dam, lake, the day lake, it deposits its nutrients, its sediment. In its sediment is all the rich for growing, <laughs> for growing crops and for arable farming and so forth. So what happens is a lot of the water, because nobody knew about this when they built the dam, a lot of the water that flows to the delta of Egypt, which is the bread basket and has been the bread basket, not only of Egypt, but of the Middle East, the Near East and parts of Africa since the time of the Pharaoh, the, since the time of the Pharaohs, the, the war, the, that water is losing its mineral quality. Egypt is already worried about that, but that's their problem because the Lake Nasser is in their part of, on their side of the border. What I'm saying is, you are going to say something about Lake Nasser, about... Do they want to assimilate your people yeah, into the... I know over, over the border in no, Aneba, no, the symbol... No, 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 you mean even no, where the hell... where the hell for? No, just in the corners. The yeah. They're yeah. nibbling away at your... Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Okay. So if you and Brother Tariq are sitting, having a coffee in a coffee house in Khartoum, discussing this issue, if you are discussing this issue, how will you, as two Sudanese, you yourself, you are a, a Nubian from the north, so you have a language other than Arabic. So you may not see yourself, you may not see yourself as an Arab. You will see yourself as an African because your language is Nubian. So you know, it's not like the Shaidiya who are Nubians like you but lost their language. And then they became the police for the, during the Bashawat and so forth. The rest is history. Uh, you're not Shaidiya. <laughs> Wallahi, <laughs> you see, you never know where you never know who you're talking to when you're talking. But I hope I haven't offended you by that. But I, I tell everybody when I speak here, I like my people, but I like truth more. So sometimes I bring the pain. Yeah. What I want to say is, with this whole situation, the deeper roots of the problem are ecological. So I can't sit and say that. Global warming is a myth and a way to, 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 to put China back in its box when China doesn't really have love for me. I'm so sorry. I don't want to, I'm not joining that fight on China's side. That's like me setting myself on fire to keep a dragon warm. You know the Chinese, the Chinese motive is a dragon. What am I, my part of Africa is overheating and, I, and I'm going to join them against the West. Why am I setting myself on fire to keep a dragon warm? I can't do that. So this is some of the problems we have to look at when we look at the, what is happening with mercenaries coming in from, like you say, speaking French, Francophone, from Ma maybe as far as Mali. But we know from Chad, definitely. Yeah. I don't know about Niger, 
from Mali, but I know definitely from Chad. We are not very keen on. But Tarek, is it true, yeah, Mr. Tarek, is it true that never before have Sudanese witnessed French speaking Africans like coming into Khartoum and Umdurman? I have never heard of it. Never before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Inadvertently, I raised a very important issue. I raised a very important issue of identity at Dawood. But remind me, Dawood, I'm going to talk about identity, Arab African identity when he finishes. The two of them just reminded me of a very important side issue that for some people is the main issue which is the sudan's problem of who is the sudan and who are the sudanese are they africans or are they arabs but go on i'll come back to that remind me when, when was a uh, child uh, ruling by uh, what you call uh, Hussein Habri was like in arab like in the quran and the quran yeah the way they go around and, and, and the, all the tribe of Bagara and uh, all these tribes they used to go there do their business and come back when the Omar Bashir was helping uh, Idris Dibbi with a gun and gave him the land to go fight the same happening <laughs> and they take the power from mm -hmm. these yeah. people yeah. that's why the people they still move in Sudan mm -hmm. because they got because they get kicked out from Chad where they go settle in Khartoum some of them settled in Khartoum, some of them settled in Darfur, some of them go to Libya, and they're using the border up and down, up and down. And some, they say still they're keeping the French language. That's why they but with, the, what, what, So with the collapse of Libya, Western Sudan has become a corridor yes. for not only people fleeing Eritrea and other parts of Africa trying to get to the Mediterranean. It's like a, it's a corridor basically yeah. to run there. Well, yeah. It's also become trafficking of every different kind. Yeah. So yeah. it's a highly volatile and stable area to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I want to turn a little bit to the question of identity in the Sudan. And I'm now channeling the same speaker from South Sudan who said the chickens have come home to roost. By which he means what the Sudanese have been doing to us is now being done to them by the same army that they had unleashed upon us. The ginger we call rapid reaction, whatever, because of the name. So let us look at the Sudan because like remember I said before, the Sudan is a microcosm of the continent of Africa. Africa has Arabs in it, and it has Africans and Arabs in it. You see what I did there? And that's the whole of Africa, where you have Algeria on the one hand, and you have South Africa on the other hand. You have all of that compressed into the Sudan. Now, for a long time, I remember in my, in my early visits to the Sudan, the people of Khartoum, Madani, Jazeera Khartoum, their self-identity was Arab. 100%. I sat just as I'm close to this gentleman, as if he's the, with the president of Sudan, Sadiq al, Sadiq al Mahdi. And I asked him about this. And Sadiq said, the overwhelming identity of our country is Arab. Our newspapers, our media, music, radios, telecommunication is with the Arabic world. Makes sense. And a lot of our people have actual lineal affiliation, nasab, linkages, paternal through to the Hejaz, to the Arab world. So there is, in a sense, a strong argument if we want to find one unifying factor for the Sudan, let it be Arabic. So I said, so what about the people who speak other languages? And to which he replied, these are his exact words. Learn Arabic, let it become your mother tongue, and you are also an Arab. I left it at that. I'm speaking to the president of Sudan. <laughs> I can't keep asking questions. I left it at that. I was 23 at the time. Now, recently I met him in London about two years ago. And we spoke and already Sudan, South Sudan had already got its independence. And I wanted to ask him about that. I want to say, well, Mr. President, can we now argue that 
The fact that this bit of the country broke away, this large, South Sudan is larger than Tanzania. It's a large, large country on its own. I said, this large chunk of Sudan was lost because of our intransigence, our attitude that they must think Arab. They must become Arab. Don't you see what we have done? He didn't answer the question. And of course, it was not a meeting set up for that. He, I was invited to dinner, so it may have been, it would have been impertinent for me to press the issue. But I'm asking the two brothers here, because this brother speaks, what is your name again, my brother? Idris is a Nuba, Nubi, uh, from a Nubian, because I don't want to confuse you from the, for the Cordofan people. He's a Nubian from the ex north north of Sudan. Are you from where the Helva? That area. Yes. And we have a brother here, Tarek, with whom I started the interview, who is a Shaypi from Marawi, Shandi or Marawi or? Yes. So we have two different intersecting worlds. We have people who have their first language who therefore understand that we have become Arab, but we are more than just Arab. True or not? So you, you accept because you have a mother tongue that I'm a Arab, I am Musta Arab, but I am a Nubian first. All right. Whereas I'm not going to speak to the intellectual Tariq. I want to speak to the emotional Tariq. How do your people view themselves? Yeah. As much. Now, have you ever challenged your elders about this? No, it's a coming around. Hell not. <laughs> no, you, won't, you won't want to do that. All right. Now, I understand the strength of the argument on both sides. The desert environment of the north part of the Sudan was similar to the environment of the Hejaz. So if some of their people came from there, there was no need to make great cultural changes. Oh, so the things that were African, they just began to consider them a form of Arabic behavior. For example, the shuluk, the marks. If you ask them, you press them hard about it, they will tell you, yes, it's from the time of Pharaoh. But generally, they would think it's maybe some other Arabs in the Gulf do that. They don't know. But definitely we know these marks are African. The Yoruba have them, the Akans take them, different Africans, not all Africans, but a large part of the continent, they do do scarification. Yes, T, uh, the Dungolawi do 111, and so forth. So what we do understand is that this is a, a, the African side of the Sudan, which is conveniently not invoked very much. If they look at the Jirtig wedding ceremony, the Jirtig has nothing to do, of course, with Arabs. It is an old, old tree. So we see that the Sudan is a combination of both. And I understand why. Now, what people have, what I have heard from some analysts from the Republic of South Sudan is that this is a battle for the soul. What's happening in Khartoum is a battle for the very soul of the Sudan, its identity. Where does it, where does it locate itself? How would you begin to, I'll ask Brother Tariq first. Brother Tariq, how would you begin to answer that? The question, okay, I'm speaking now as though I were an analyst looking north from Juba, from the capital of the South, of the Republic of South. And they would say, what you see unfolding in Khartoum is a battle for the soul of Sudan. It's inner identity. Is it Arab or is it African? True, it may have to choose. What do you say to that? Oh, uh, mm. No, no, I, I have to, I have to, now I would like to ask you, you don't necessarily have to, re, to respond to that yet, but people are saying that this is a battle, it's a, it's about how Sudanese should see themselves as Africans 
or as Arabs. Is that a problem at all for, for people in Wadi Halfa in the northern north, in north north? Is that an issue? No. What's the main thing here? Yeah. So you would agree when Sadiq said that the Arabic language should, should remain as the chief unifying factor for the whole of the Sudan. You would agree with that? You would have agreed if you were talking to him as I had been talking to him. I agree because if everybody speaks Arabic, it's okay. Because, right. uh, because the language. Mm. Uh, because we can't choose from any tribe, even though we won't be living as language. Now, I would like to push on both of these guys, like saying, first of all, Libya had one language. It didn't stop Libya from disintegrating. And on the other hand, South Sudan has their African identity. It hasn't stopped South Sudan, the Republic, from disintegrating. So both sides of the argument can be, can, 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 can be challenged. Both sides. Of, if you say the problem in the, of Sudan is a problem for the soul, whether Arabic, Arab, Arab or African, yet here's now the Republic of South Sudan, its own capital of Juba, Yet you have the two most the two significant ethnic groups. They are about thirty something more. But the Dinka and the Nuer at each other's throats, and they are actually close brothers at each other's throats. Their languages are at times intercomprehensible. They can, Dinka and Nuer they can perhaps understand each other like Norwegian and Swedish. Yet it hasn't stopped them. Yeah, so being African hasn't stopped them from being. The, no, but I, I, I'm, I'm pushing back on my own argument about that I put forward the argument about if they have a one identity, Africa. If, if Sudanese agree that they are Africans, it would bring peace. Mm. But that's my very point. The people who have controlled Khartoum have always given it an Arabic identity. And they have marginalized the West, the North North, the East, and the South, and, and, and Cordoba and the center. They have, in fact, power has only been devolved from Khartoum to Jazeera to Madani. Nowhere else. So. No, what I'm asking is the underpinning. No, we've done that. We know yeah. this. We've established its survival. But what I will, what I like to do, yeah. I like to drill deeper. Okay. I want to get is, is this an eco, is it an ecological problem or is it an identity? Let me tell you something now. I'm putting this on record. The problem, the problem of Brexit is a problem for the soul of this country. It's nothing to do with economics. The British have lost their way. The poor white working class has been undereducated, like the black man. And therefore, he can only answer simple emotional questions, such as, you want to be with them Europeans or not? No, we want to be British, mate. You have to give people simple questions when they're not very deep. This question about being, they know they're going to be poorer. The British know they're going to be poorer, but they don't care. Why? What they're saying is what Jesus said in the Bible. Man does not live, anybody know the quote? By bread alone. In other words, we have no identity. We don't care if we are hungry as long as we are British and English and proud. That is why I invoke the question of the soul of the Sudan, whether it's going to be Arab or African. Why, why it's happening here. Uh, why did why you, our what, what, I'll bring you one second. Why our revolution is stuck? Because we know we can just leave water and bread. We leave water and water and Yeah, I agree with you. I'm not saying that it's more important to fix your identity. 
right? Although Jesus said in the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else shall be added thereunto. The communists will not say that. The communists, the socialists will say, no, 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 no. I got our fresh water. I got our air to breathe. Good, uh, uh, I got our food, clothes on my back. I got have a place to sleep. I, my children have to be educated. I have to have freedom of the press and expression. And then we can talk about identity. That's the socialist argument. I, sorry, this gentleman really wanted to come. I just wanted to ask you, you were talking about Sudan there, not a country I know that much about, but uh, why didn't you mention two religions there, Christianity and Islam? Because that's what the West wants us to do. Now I agree with you, the North, by identifying being Arab and Muslim as the same thing, to me that was a very wrong thing. So I'm put, I'll, as a Muslim, I cannot dissociate myself from that problem in the Sudan. The problem of making Islam an Arab coterminous. And that is what brassed off the South. They were saying, look, we neither. We're not Arabs and we're not Muslim and we want to be neither. So why impose this? And to that extent, they are correct. Now what I'm saying, so your point stands. Your point stands. The reason, you, uh, sorry, I don't sorry, like to belabor it. Just a point of information. There are two countries in Sudan now. No, right? yeah. Republic of South Sudan. Okay. The reason I don't like to belabor it is because of what is happening in places like Mali, where it is not that sharply etched a divide. It's, there's no Arabs in the north of Mali saying to be Muslim is to be Arab and vice versa, and African. What you have in Mali is nearly everybody's a Muslim. What you're having, however, are people who are saying the Fulani, because of desertification, are joining the were joining the jihadists and Saruddin and Akim Al Qaeda and the Maghreb was remaining of them. The Fulani have to protect themselves because when the war had been taking place, Fulani lost a lot of lands. So some of the more religious Fulani explain their predicament in religious terms, and most Fulani are getting blamed for being jihadists, which is not true. That is why I was loath. I was reluctant to to invoke of religion. It's in the Quran, yeah. Though. Kill, kill, kill your enemies. It's, it, it is in the Quran. In the course. Bible too. But I'm not talking about religion. No, don't do that. He, he wants it. And now I realize he's mischievous. I, had I spotted him from you, you know, I was giving him the benefit of the doubt up till now. Now I shall have to ignore him and press on. You are ignored, sir. All right. Say no more. I shall listen. I might learn something. Yeah. Yeah. So, we have established that um, the conflict in Sudan predominantly was reported and it's been talked about on social media. In fact, when I went to BBC News, on BBC uh, YouTube channel, and I, I looked into the comment section, there's plenty of people saying, I only know, I only know about Sudan through Instagram. Right? Because what's been happening is uh, something we haven't discussed, a lot of in Sudan, the revolution in Sudan, there's a lot of young people who are participating in it. It's a revolution by the young, through the young. And the language, if you if you um, identify the language around it, I, I haven't seen, I haven't come across what you were talking about between uh, the South being Arabic and vice versa. Vice versa. No, I, no. I haven't identified it. I think what, you, what you've done there is maybe looking into the future because when you look at revolutions, the revolution evolved and they change and the intention change and new groups come in and then there's this other group coming in. In the, I think the, in the first wave, guess what? Yeah, out. Yeah. So I think there's a possibility that it could develop into that most certainly just because it's in the DNA and the history of, of Sudan. Um, but at this stage, I feel like they have just to understand very simply, and I think it is economical, right? They want to change. There was apparently there was a, a drought. Right? Whoa, well, after <laughs> years. Not there, just the whole of that area going across, even from Mauritania straight across to Eritrea, right? Ethiopia. But what I want to come quickly back because that's the ecological factor. To me, to me, that is the basis of the problems in Africa, desertification in those regions and so forth. But then we come back to the question of identity. Now, to look at the Sudan from the last time I was there, 1990, when the Jihad took power and Turabi and so forth and Omar Bashir and all that, yeah. I do remember the Gulf War, it coincided with the first Gulf War. And during the first Gulf War, unwisely or wisely depending on your point of view, the Sudan took the side of Saddam Hussein. 
Palestinian, Palestinians took the side of Saddam Hussein and Yemenis took the side of Saddam Hussein. What happened? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 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 you're taking me somewhere else. I'm trying to build this up. So what I'm saying is this, what happened in the Sudan back then is the Sudan was almost evicted from the Arab League. They were blackballed as the war, or from the Arab League. I think Yemen too, the Arabs in the Gulf started kicking all the Yemeni out. All the Sudanese are the Sudanese were replaced by Egyptians, whom the Gulf would like to get rid of and they can't get rid of. The Egyptians have entrenched themselves in professional positions once held up till 1990 by the Sudanese. And from that time onwards, the Sudanese began to develop a more African idea of their identity. So it had, it's like a slow burn on your cooker, but it has been coming since the night. There was a Kuwaiti poet who sang about the temerity of the Sudanese to take the side of Saddam, because you know, Saddam had invaded Kuwait. So this Kuwaiti poet sang a song, a song saying, how dare that half-caste nation, Hajin, Hujana, how dare they involve themselves in Arab business? Yeah. Who, who are they, this half-caste people, to involve? And from that point onwards, they were, even people were saying, um, uh, Turabi was originally Falata. They say his ancestors, and he wasn't denying it. He was like proud. Yes, I'm African. I am Afalati. We, our people come from originally Western Sudan, maybe Burkina, wherever. And that they say he's a Fulani in origin. Some say I don't know. Allahu Alim. But I, what Daoud, what I'm trying to build up to is the idea of being an African in that in the north, in the Khartoum part of Sudan has been growing slowly and steadily. However, when I was there in '85. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> that we're discussing the Nubian thing. Yes, of course, because what? Yes, there, yeah, what he's saying is there is an emphasis on Sudan's history prior to its the uh, arrival of Islam, and even prior to the influences that came from Pharaonic Egypt showing that the civilization of the Nubian people is indigenous. Yeah, you remember they were showing the round, the roundable style, the round type of house, which you still find in Ethiopia. As much as if Ethiopians think they are an African, nobody built in that part of the world round houses like that. That is an evidence of African culture. And more, that house that goes like this round, not, not square houses. Yeah, how you call it? Good thing I learned the word there. And we you and me have to sit down and talk. Now, that's all I wanted to talk about as far as I think there is identity politics involved. And like I was saying to the gentleman here, do not downplay. I don't want to talk about religion too much because I realize I spend a lot of time here talking about religion. Of course you're not going to talk about No, religion. I don't want to go away. No, for right? good, for a good you, reason. You've never heard me talk here before. That's why you're saying that I've talked a lot about religion. Oh, and yeah. the religious aspect makes it an international problem. It does. So I'm not running away. I did accede to his point. I'm not running away from the religious side. Jabal Islamia. How can I run away if your name is Jabha? Your name is Jabha. I can't run away from it. However, what I am saying is this. I'm saying what we need to look at are the local factors, the environmental factor, the question of local identity, right? You have the situation where, for example, in terms of local identity, when the, the Bagara have a beef against the Khartoum people, the Bagara believe we never stop being nomads. Badu. Our Arabic is the pure Arabic. We are still, as we left the Hejaz. The people from Khartoum laugh at them. They say, look at your faces, you Africans who are speaking Arabic. And you are keeping more of your cow. Shut up your cow. Shut up your cowboys. And when Al Mahdi, uh, the Khalifa, Abdullah Ta'ashi, Ta Ta'ashi, the Khalifa, is my true? Yes, when they succeed, which is a tribe of Bagara, the Ta'ash, Ta'asha, right? When Abdullah Ta'ashi, the Khalifa of the Mahdi, was fighting in as far as Ethiopia. The Battle of Galabat, Battle of Galabat, eh? I can't remember the year. When he was, he, the bulk of his army came from Western Sudan. So can you imagine from the West? So these, so the Westerners have achieved a reputation, especially 
the Battle of Khartoum. They receive a reputation as being Christian. Yeah, the reason is all Bagara. The reason I got we, we did we did say that before you came. That all of these people from the Western Sudan who see themselves as Arabs feel as if they have not been given acceptance by the Jali and uh, Jawama and this river Arab, the river rain Arabs. So to which they reply, you are not Arabs, you are most, yeah, you are like the Shaiki, you are Nubians, yeah, Jindaba. No, Jindaba has a historical meaning, I will go into it later. They will say people like you guys, to as far as uh, Madani, you guys are not even Arabs, you are Nubians speaking Arabic. We, Bagara, the Misteri, even the Misteri who are black on, they are the real Arabs, because they are nomadic. Well, you people laugh at them and call them cowboys. I know, because I live there. I saw people laugh. Look, the cowboys are passing. So, long story. I know, it's long story. It's, I know, but it's very, I'd like, I'd like to sit down and discuss that deeper, that deeper history with you. But that's a long, long story. I can sense that, brother, content is ready to wrap this up. And so am I. I think we've, I think we've, oh, brother, see you. Who should? <laughs> yeah, did you hear that? Listen, you're not, you're something will interest you. Listen to his talk. Say to him. Say what you say to him. Kalasi, Yahi, you finish? Oh, I see you moving. Yes, the Israelis. No, it's, they have always believed some small thing like this. Remember, the literature, I, that's another subject. Let us leave by. Bani Israel because the Patan, Pashtun people say that they are Bani Israel. Yes. If everybody is Bani Israel, that must, they must have been doing some serious. <laughs> they must have been. The same I'm going to use some foul language on the and spoil the whole thing. I was say they must have been having a lot of children if everybody is Bani Israel. From you know, as far as the Pashtun say that they are Bani Israel to Khalas, let us leave this Lemba of Zimbabwe and all these people who say that they are Bani Israel. Forget about them. Okay. Forget about them. All I will say is. There are, there, there, there's politics of identity involved, there are ecological factors, and there are simple matters like we need freedom of expression. Like I said, humans have basic needs, air, food, water. Air, water, food, in that order. Air, seven minutes without air, and you're dead. Seven days without water, and you're dead. Seven weeks without food and you're dead. After you have that one, you want clothing and shelter. So I, we thought, we know that's what people want. When communists and socialists say that, I say, look, you're telling me that the sky, the grass is green. I know that. But I think humans are more, when we have our needs satisfied, we have a roof over our head, our children have some education, we got health, wellness and health services, we have freedom of expression. Now, there is more we want, which is what is to do with who are we? We are the only animal that asks that question. Yes, an elephant drinking at a pool will look and say, that's me. An elephant can recognize it. A chimpanzee can recognize itself. Not all animals can recognize themselves, but humans go further. Humans ask questions. What can I know? Where did I come from? What is the meaning of life? And to ignore that the Sudanese have these questions like anybody else, we got to come to grips with it. We got to come to grips with the fact that yes, there may be an identity aspect to the Sudanese uh, demonstration. There could be, there's a geological, a climatological, environmental aspect to what is happening in the Sudan. Kaza, 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 and inshallah, was the story. I want to say thank you very much for, for helping me bring this forward. And Sheikh uh, uh, Idris, a Nubian. Thank you for helping me bring this forward. The water. Countryman. Let me bring to you. The Go water, on now. The point that you bring out about the water. Fresh water. Is that uh, um, the Nile America mm -hmm. sells United Nations food. And to keep the land, uh, disturb the, the, the river, the Nile, mm -hmm. the flow of water, and have a drought. United Nations won't be able to sell any food. And American farmers, the food spoil. They won't get, they won't be able to sell. So the idea is from the American government ensuring that the Nile don't work properly. 
so they, they, they have an interest in this destabilization of the country. But what Brother Dawood said is that, and Brother Farik said is, really that revolution was from grassroots up. There was no interference in it. What they did, what they did, they used the CIA in an indirect way on the dictator. He's under the dictator control. Now, what is happening is that certain things have been revealed, and this is why they're able to ra begin to round them up. They're going to put them on trial. Because a whole lot of Ross money that he gets. Keep, look, guys, keep talking. It's, it's not the benefit of the Chinese. It's not directly the benefit of the Chinese. Uncle Afrigo, yeah? Yeah. Check it out, Thank you so much. It's not that direct. From your Man, say it straight. Man, don't listen to BBC. Man, don't listen to IT. You have to be observing a change, of course. This, uh, For example, you can see me change my mind. If they observe it's changing with the change, then there's no point for us to say there was change. Exactly. Like I just said, brother, we've spoken before a little bit. Um, it's my hand, of course. 